Compton News Live and Viewer Television. I'm Ekia Martin for headlines. Senate passes real estate regulatory bill to check fraud. NEMA receives 95 stranded Nigerians from Libya. And on the foreign scene, blast hits Shite district of Kabul and kills at least two. Now, President Mohamed Buhari has felicitated with former President Goodluck Jonathan on his 64th birthday today, November the 17th, describing him as an apostle of peace and democracy in Africa. The president, in a release by his media advisor Femi Adeshino, on behalf of the government of Nigerians, rejoiced with Jonathan and congratulated him for serving the country and working for the peace and advancement of democracy on the African continent. The statement affirms that Jonathan had continued to expand the boundaries of leadership, teaching many in the country the power of focus, consistency, and diligence. Having served as Deputy Governor, Governor, Vice President, President, African Union Envoy, and now Chairman International Summit Council for Peace Africa. The President therefore extended warm greetings to his predecessor and family, praying that the Almighty God will continue to sustain them in good health. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Baja Biamila, has called for the prosecution of owners and staff of private laboratories issuing fake COVID-19 certificates across the country. Bajabi Abina made the call during an interactive session with heads of various agencies under the Federal Ministry of Aviation as expressed displeasure over the presence of these rocketeers at the airport who engaged in unethical practices. The lawmaker has further advocated for the establishment of a government agency such as the Transportation Security Administration to regulate the activities of operators within airports in Nigeria. In a remark, the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Ifedaya Aditifa, revealed that some individuals who issued fake COVID-19 certificates were arrested and handed over to the Department of State Security for persecution. He argued that some of the private laboratories might not be involved in the fake COVID-19 certificate, but by some corrupt individuals who allegedly connived with some officials at the airports. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives has passed for second reading a bill to make health care delivery for Nigerian children free and compulsory. The bill sponsored by Bello Kauje was passed during the plenary on Wednesday. He said that the proposed bill was occasioned by the fact that children's health is different from that of adults because they are exposed to many risks. Although lawmakers raised concerns over funding, however, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Baja Biamila, said the House should not wait to pass the bill as regards funding. The Speaker puts the bill through a voice vote and was passed and referred to the House Committee on Health Care Services. The service shall cover referral cases of children from other state, local government hospital, or any other private hospital in Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, monitoring and implementation of the bill is to ensure implementation of this act upon commencement of the Federal Ministry of Health shall make definite procedures, guidelines, as well as monitor and implement the provision of this act, coordinate free health care service delivery to these children in Nigeria and ensure transparency and accountability in the free health care service delivery. Teach them they are backed by law. And one of their functions is to provide health care delivery services. You understand? Yes, Even services does not necessarily mean free. You remember yesterday when we were discussing, you said that it is implied that everybody should dress formally. So also, since the essence of their being is to provide health care delivery services as national primary health care in rural areas, the, it is assumed that whatever money that is appropriated to them, they must profit into providing that health care delivery service. should be able to bring to fore what is the statistics of children in this country, what is the quantum of medical bills settled by families for children in this country. Do we have a corresponding provision in the budget that the primary health care development agency can be able to support these families in providing this free medical care. Mr. Speaker, the, we make the budget. We also make the laws. And if we do not have provisions in our budget 
that will support what we are trying to put into law, we will be helping in putting up laws that are unimplementable in our country. Because this is not justiciable, this, are, this, are, this is based on the fundamental objectives of state, uh, state objectives and principles. He is now giving teeth to it by saying whether this, uh, even in 15, 20 years' time, a government must comply with this law that child delivery must be free. We're not leaving it to policy. Including what? Okay. So I think uh, I think uh, I, I I think um, 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 the the point has been made. And that senator has passed a bill to establish the Real Estate Regulatory Council of Nigeria. The B, the past bill would help curb fraudulent practices to ensure that the real estate businesses confirms to National Building Code in Nigeria. Also, it is to create an innovative and sustainable environment to promote Nigeria as a real estate investment destination in Africa and the world. The passage of the bill on Wednesday during plenary presided over by Deputy President of Senate, Ovie Omo Agege, was sequel to the consideration of a report by the Committee on the Establishment of on establishment and public service, the Senate and the Committee of the Whole considered and approved clauses as amended, interpretation as recommended, explanatory memorandum as recommended, short and long titles as recommended. Welcome to News Plus on Viewer Television. I am Charles Doke. Hello and welcome to News Plus on Viewer Television. I am Jerry Malik. Hello and welcome to News Plus. I am John Matake. Hello and welcome to News Plus. I am Ike Omar Welcome back. The Federal Executive Council has approved contracts worth a total sum of $27.4 billion for projects and their works in housing and the Federal Capital Territories Ministries. The Council presided over by President Mohamed Buhari at the Presidential Villa Abuja on Wednesday also approved the establishment of a Federal University of Health Sciences. Similarly, it approved the raising of a bill for the enactment of the Civil Defense Corrections Fire and Immigration Services Board. Minister of Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, FCT Minister Mohamed Bello, Interior Minister Ralph Aregbeshola, and Special Advisor to the President of Media and Publicity, Femi Adeshina, briefed correspondence on the outcome of the meeting. According to him, FEC approved the, punish the appointment of consultants to supervise the ongoing construction of the Bodoboni Highway in River State as well as the construction of the Ida Unsoka Road and Kogi Enugu states, putting the cost of both projects at 27.067 billion naira. Now, the National Emergency Management Agency on Wednesday received 95 Nigerians stranded from Libya at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos. Habib Mustafa, the Director General of NEMA, who was represented by the Acting Coordinator, of the Lagos Territorial Office of the agency, Ibrahim Farinloye, confirmed the developments to newsmen in Lagos. Farinloye said that the stranded Nigerians arrived at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport on Tuesday night at about 20.18 p.m. with Al Burak Airline. He said that the returnees were brought back to the country by the International Organization for Migration through Voluntary Repatriation Program for the distressed who had left the country to seek greener pastures in various European countries but could not afford to return when their journey became frustrated. He also said that the returnees are 60 male adults, 29 female adults, 
three male and one female teenager with two infants. He assured the returnees that the federal government and the IOM, along with all their international partners, will not disappoint them as Nigerians by providing the enabling environment for them to achieve their potentials. When News Live returns, the wives of Nigeria's service chiefs have urged troops at the front line to be steadfast in their fight against insurgents. Details of this and more come to you shortly after the break. Do join us again. Okay. Uh, first of all, you being a news anchor, you have to be in the news. When I mean in the news, you have to read the news like a book. You have to understand the stories and of course you have to prepare your mind because there are a lot of stories that when you read, they are actually so shaking. So from the editor to the reporter to the uh, scriptor and so many other people working, it has been a wonderful thing. You juggling up and down, meeting different people, you know, sharing ideas on how to actually put this wonderful piece of work into the public. It has been a wonderful experience. And you get to hear stories that are actually so shaking. It takes a lot for you to be able to understand or absorb some of the frightening news you read. And of course, it opens your mind for you to understand that there is a lot that needs to be done in the part of the government and the problems of the masses. Pararam pra reparar Estão ouvindo esse som Usando seco no ar Merece nossa atenção Preparem bem os sensores Para poder captar Parem usinas motores Welcome back to News Live. A quick recap of our top stories. Senate passes real estate regulatory bill to check fraud. The NEMA receives 95 stranded Nigerians from Libya. Plus blast hits Shite district of Kabul and kills at least two. The wives of the Nigeria service chiefs has urged troops at the front lines to be steadfast in their fight against insurgents. This was disclosed by the service chief's wives during a visit to the Maimalari Cantonment Theatre Command in Meduguri, led by the President of Defence and Poli Police Officers' Wives Association, Victor Irabo. The wife of the Chief of Defence Staff, Victoria Irabo, encouraged soldiers to continue their constitutional commitment to ensuring peace in the Northeast. The senior officers' wives are in Meduguri to commiserate with Operation Hadin Kai over the loss of its men in a terrorist ambush in a Sikara attack. It is well in the barracks. It is well. 
the barracks we left, we are able to, by the grace of God, keep the home front. So, be rest assured that your families are doing well. And be encouraged. Be hopeful. Continue to trust in God. Because your wives and children back home are all praying for you. Without your support, we don't have a lot of Nigerian presence around in the Northwest and the Northeast. So we really thank you for the support. This, this is a partnership that works, a partnership in progress, a partnership in success. While you work on the Atlantic, we ensure that we look at social and economic realities of our people so that you don't show out of energy so that we can meet the work less. I know the truth, knowing that you are here, know that you care for us. And we can assure you that the troops are ever ready, despite the setback, to continue to push until we have the much needed peace in the Northeast. And we assure you that we we'll continue to push, we we'll continue to ensure that we destroy all the enemies of the country, wherever they are and whoever is sponsoring them. The United States government, as well as several human rights groups, including Amnesty International, have called for action on the report of the Lagos State Judicial Panel of Inquiry on restitution for victims of SARS-related abuses and other matters which stated that at least nine persons were killed and 39 others injured at the Lekki Toll Plaza on October 20th, 2020. The Justice Doris Okubi-led panel after its report recommended that all soldiers, including Major General Omata, who were deployed in the Lekki toll gate, should be made to face appropriate disciplinary action, stripped of their ranks and dismissed as they were not fit and proper to serve in any public or security office of the nation. Responding to the report, the United States Mission to Nigeria said it welcomed the final report by the panel, adding that it awaits the response of both the federal government and legal state government. Accordingly, the United Nations Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator for Nigeria, Edward Kalon, noted that the submission of the findings of the judicial panel will accelerate the process of justice and accountability. The House of Representatives has called for the establishment of an intervention board for the judiciary, insisting that it had been long overdue. Chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Judiciary, Onofiok Luke, stated this during the budget and defense of some agencies in the judiciary on Wednesday, insisting that this is the only way the judiciary can carry out their responsibilities effectively. Onofiok further emphasized the need for a secured environment, better living condition, and provision of advanced technological infrastructure for them. On the invasion of Justice Mary Odile's residence, the House warned that such a thing should not repeat itself. Different sectors of the economy have had intervention fund. Uh, the, we had intervention fund for sports. We have had intervention fund for youth. We have had intervention fund for entertainment. I don't think that it would be out of place for the federal government to have an intervention fund for the judiciary. We believe that this is the only way that the judiciary can meet up with its um, competing demands and challenges facing the judiciary as we go on. And of importance to us in this committee is that we have started an advocacy as a committee and then it has been adopted partly by the House that we are seeking for the review of salaries and remunerations of judicial officers. And so we are going to be seeking for your cooperation. We are going to be seeking for the cooperation of Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Physical Commission in this regard, so that um, an exercise that was undertaken 14 years ago needs an upward review today. We need to revisit, revisit it. Nigeria's territorial sovereignty appears to be under threat as Ambazonian separatists from South Cameroon invaded Banga community in Takum local government area of Taraba State, killing several people. A senator representing Taraba South, Senatorial District Emmanuel Bwacha, who raised the alarm during the commencement of plenary on Wednesday, bemoaned the killing of the village head of Manga community and some residents. Senator Bwacha, who is also the Senate Deputy Minority Leader, said the invasion of the community 
by the separatists from neighboring Cameroon led to the sack of residents of Manga village. He therefore called on the military to immediately swing into action to prevent the eventual occupation of the Manga community by separatists. The Senate thereafter held a minute silence to honor those killed by the Ambazonia separatists from southern Cameroon in the Manga community. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Union of Local Government Employees have demanded an immediate release of 12 of their members working with Zaria local government who have been kidnapped since November the 8th, 2021. National President of the Union, Akim Olatunji, made the demand in Abuja while urging President Mohamed Buhari to intervene by prevailing on the Kaduna State Government and security agencies to ensure the safe return of its members. Olatunji lamented the silence of the Kaduna State Government since the abduction of the workers. He warned that the union will be left with no other option than to take drastic actions nationwide if her plea for the release of the workers fell on deaf ears. Alatunji further disclosed that the kidnappers have contacted the families of the victims and are demanding 40 million naira ransom. 13 of them were kidnapped in a local government official vehicle and the driver was free to go and tell the families. We now bring you international and business news shortly after the break. Do join us again. Hello and welcome to Business News. I am Joy Malik. Now, the Minister of Mines and Steel Development, Olamili Kanadegbite, has stated that Nigeria is currently the best place for both foreign and local investors to invest in, as the Nigerian mining sector is still green and investors can reap maximum profit. The Minister made this ascension while briefing members of the press at the pre event press conference for the Nigerian Mining Week held at the Ministry's headquarters. Adegbite disclosed that the interactions at the Mining Week would avail investors an opportunity to know where to invest. According to him, the country would benefit from the mining week as it is a purely investment driven event and would afford the ministry to showcase its over 44 minerals that abound across the country. He further stressed that letting the world know what minerals the nation has would bring investors flooding into the country. Now, Central Bank of Nigeria Governor Godwin Imefele says about 3 trillion naira has been distributed to families, farmers, and companies to cash on the COVID 19 impact. MFL made the revelation in an interview with newsmen at the 2021 Inter-African Trade Fair in Durban, South Africa. He said the CBN had been playing complementary roles for the benefit of Nigerians and businesses. The CBN chief added that large agricultural companies and manufacturing companies are also assessing 10 years loans with two-year marantorum and single-digit rates. He further recalled that when the coronavirus struck, President Mohamed Buhari taxed him and Finance Minister Zainab Ahmed to work together and suggest an immediate response. MFL said President Buhari subsequently approved the establishment of the Economic Sustainability Program chaired by Vice President Yemiosi Banjo. And lastly, the e era introduced by the Central Bank of Nigeria's digital currency will reduce the cost of annual diaspora remittance to Nigeria, the International Monetary Fund has said. Nigerians in diaspora remit $24 billion annually, mostly between 1 to 5% of the amount being sent constitutes remittance fee. IMF country focused release by Jack Ree of the IMF African Department identified Nigeria as one of the major remittance destinations in sub-Saharan Africa, with remittance received amounting to $24 billion in 2019. Now, according to him, the IMF will willingly offer technical assistance and policy advice, adding that the Fund's Monetary and Capital Market Department was involved in the e-NERA rollout process by providing product design reviews. The IMF chief says exchange rates reforms, including a unified market clearing rate that reduces the gap between official and parallel market exchange rate, would enhance the in incentives of using e-NERA wallets to send remittance. And that's all we can take on business news. Thank you for watching.
And on the international scene, I am Jennifer Okolo. An Egyptian court on Wednesday sentenced a prominent human rights lawyer to five years in prison for his conviction on charges that rights advocates have decried as baseless and politically motivated. The Mesodemonial State Security Emergency Court in Cairo found Zayad El Almi, a former lawmaker guilty of conspiracy, conspiring rather to commit crimes with an outlawed group. That's a reference to the Muslim Brotherhood, which Egypt has banned as a terrorist organization. The court also sentenced journalists Hassan Muniz and Hisham Fuad to four years in prison on the same charges. Two other defendants got three-year sentences. All were fined 500 Egyptian pounds. Defense lawyer Khalid Ali says Wednesday verdict is not subject to appeal before civilian courts because it was issued by an emergency court. He said the defense would file an appeal to a military court. While well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called for efforts to end a year-long conflict in Ethiopia to be intensified, warning that the violence poses a risk to security in the Horn of Africa region, conflict has been raging in Ethiopia since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered an incursion into the northern Tigray province last November after forces loyal to the regional administration attacked a federal army base. The fighting has spilled into neighboring regions, claiming the lives of thousands of people, displacing hundreds of thousands and more, and leaving millions in need of aid. The U.S. and the European Union are both considering punitive measures against Ethiopia and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which was the country's prominent power broker for decades before it was sidelined by Abiy over the failure to end the crisis. African Union envoy Olu Shegun of Asanjo is spearheading efforts to broker a ceasefire. What we're both deeply concerned is Ethiopia. Uh, the conflict there threatens not just that country, but its neighbors as well. I very much appreciate President Kenyatta's engagement on this, including at the United Nations and in person in Ethiopia. We're working closely with Kenya, the African Union, and its high representative for the Horn of Africa, former Nigerian President Obasanjo, uh, as well as other partners. Our special envoy, Jeff Feltman, is working with High Representative Obasanjo to press the parties to end hostilities immediately and without preconditions, to stop human rights abuses and violations, to provide humanitarian access for the millions in northern Ethiopia who are in dire need of life-saving supplies. Well, Queen Elizabeth II met with the British military's chief of staff at the Windsor Castle on Wednesday, the first time she was seen carrying out a face-to-face -face engagement since she missed the National Remembrance Sunday service due to a sprained back. The 95-year-old monarch looked well as she chatted with General Nick Kaiser in Windsor Castle, Okroom. The Queen, who wore a colorful floral dress, stood to welcome Kaita, who is preparing to step down from his role as the Armed Forces Chief at the end of November. Recall that concerns about the monarch's health were raised last month when she spent a night in a London hospital after being admitted for medical tests. In late October, palace officials said the monarch had been told by doctors to rest for two weeks and only take on light duties. Elizabeth is Britain's longest living and longest reigning monarch and is due to celebrate her platinum jubilee 70 years on the throne next year. Well, at least two people were killed and five wounded in a bomb blast that hit a minibus in Kabul on Wednesday. Officials say this is the latest in the series of attacks in the Afghan capital. The blast destroyed the vehicle in Dashat Ibarchi, a Taliban official told newsmen in a suburb dominated by minority Hazara Shahids. Recall that last week, a journalist was killed and at least four people injured when a bomb destroyed other minibus in the same area. The Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, Khorasan group claimed responsibility of the attack, boasting it had killed or injured 20 shared apostates in the incident. The group has also claimed several attacks in the city of Jalalbad, the capital of eastern Nangaria province, and a hotbed of ISIS-K activity. And that's much we can take. Thanks for watching.
And that's all on News Live. But before we go, a quick recap of the headlines. We brought you in the Senate passes real estate regulatory bill to check fraud. We also informed you that NEMA receives 95 stranded Nigerians from Libya. And blast hits Shai district of Kabul and kills at least two. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.